We know how to use power iteration to find the largest eigenvalue for a matrix. By doing a little trick, we can do a similar thing to find the smallest eigenvalue. And it boils down to this. We know the whole idea of an eigenvalue and eigenvector is that a times v is equal to lambda times v. Well, let's multiply both sides by a inverse. So v is equal to lambda times a inverse v. And then by multiplying by 1 over lambda, assuming lambda is not 0, we get that a inverse times v is 1 over lambda times v. So what this says is that the eigenvalues for a inverse are exactly the reciprocals of the eigenvalues for a. So that means that if I use power iteration on a inverse, then I find the largest eigenvalue for a inverse, but that's the reciprocal of the smallest eigenvalue for a. Makes perfect sense, but the problem is, is that to do power iteration, we would need to know what a inverse is. And of course, finding the inverse to a matrix is a numerically challenging task. So we're going to play around with this a little bit. The basic idea of doing power iteration is that my k plus 1 guess is equal to the matrix. In this case, we're talking about a inverse times the kth guess. But I can flip this around, multiply both sides by a. So a times vk plus 1 is equal to vk. And then if I know vk, I'm just solving a system of equations to get vk plus 1. And that's something we've studied repeatedly. There's efficient ways of figuring this out. So there's efficient ways of getting the next guess even for the inverse matrix without knowing the inverse matrix. But even so then, even using this trick, we can get the largest eigenvalue for A, we can get the smallest eigenvalue for A, but if we had, for example, a 200 by 200 matrix, that leaves 198 eigenvalues to go. We're going to do a trick called shifting. And the basic idea is, let's suppose we know there's some eigenvalue near a value s. Now, it can't actually equal s. If it were to equal to s, this process would fail. But if we knew that there was an eigenvalue near some value s, what about a minus si? Let's go ahead and call the eigenvalue lambda that's near s. If I do a minus si, that has an eigenvalue of lambda minus s. So if by choosing the right s, I make this to be the smallest eigenvalue in a minus si, this inverse power iteration then finds the largest eigenvalue of A. Okay. By finding this eigenvalue here, this is the smallest eigenvalue of A minus Si, this inverse power iteration will find it. So, Let's put that together into a little algorithm. We're going to start with a guess, just like before. And then what we're going to do, and we'll also start with a shift.
So then, 4, j equals 1, 2, 3. Again, we're iterating. We'll normalize the vector, just like we did for our standard thing. Then we'll solve this system of equations. We'll solve the a minus si times x sub j is equal to my u sub j minus 1, that normalized vector we just found. Again, we're finding the largest eigenvalue of this, which is the smallest, or sorry, the smallest eigenvalue of this inverse, which will be the largest eigenvalue of this. Okay. So that means that, and then of course, that actual eigenvalue is. that. Okay. There we go. So by, again, shifting to the right thing, shifting so that this a minus si has the smallest eigenvalue, its inverse has the largest eigenvalue, and we're finding that. Okay, now the question is then, how do we find the shift s? And honestly, there isn't a really good way to do this. You kind of have to just guess at different shifts, run the process for different values of s, trying to find different eigenvalues using it. Because this is an efficient enough process, it's not an amazing way to do it, but it's certainly better than other ways of finding eigenvalues. Just trying different shifts, seeing which eigenvalues come out of that. Hopefully you, with enough iterations or enough attempts at this, you get all the different eigenvalues.